Welcome to Best Evidence. I'm John Titus. Today we're going to turn from the Federal Reserve to the Justice Department and the lack of any major bank prosecution in the wake of the financial crisis. To put the issue into perspective, imagine that you hire two crews to catch fish. The first crew takes a motorboat out onto a lake and after a good amount of time comes back with a thousand fish, some of which are the biggest fish in the lake, some 50 pounders. A pretty good outing. The second crew takes an aircraft carrier out into the Atlantic Ocean, and after the same amount of time as the first crew, the captain of the carrier comes back and with a completely straight face presents you with a five-gallon paint bucket containing ten minnows. And he brags about it. This isn't a joke, it's completely real, and it's going on right now. The lake is a savings and loan crisis from the 1980s, when 1,000 criminally fraudulent bankers went to prison. That crisis ran $125, maybe $150 billion in damage. The ocean is the current crisis that started in 2008. By the most conservative estimates, it's a $13 trillion crisis, and it's not over. Because here's the thing. The captain of the motorboat, Bill Black, publicly offered many times to help the DOJ out with prosecutions. And yet, despite Black's track record of success, the DOJ rejected each and every one of his offers. It is time to cope with the fact that the catastrophic failure in the United States Justice Department is the work of the treasonous criminals who are running it. Now, sir, uh, about in general about the Department of Justice, uh, isn't it true that, that nations that have fallen into totalitarianism that one of the agencies of government that's become totalitarian or a tool of totalitarianism has been the Department of Justice. Isn't that one of the key agencies that shows deterioration? A dictator must get control of the Justice Department and the police, the interior. So if our own country, as, as many people fear, if our own country should ever fall into totalitarianism, the Department of Justice would be one of the first failures, wouldn't it? It would be an absolutely essential cog in such a machine. There was always something off about the DOJ's announcement that it wouldn't prosecute Goldman Sachs. Normally the DOJ doesn't decline prosecutions in public, but Goldman made headlines robbing its own clients. Amid rising popular bloodlust, the DOJ felt it had to explain why Goldman walked, which is remarkable all by itself. But that's not what's odd. The statement itself is flawed and not in some random paragraph. It's the one sentence that had to be perfect, the money shot giving Goldman a pass, which is legally inexplicable. Based on the law and evidence as they exist at this time, there is not a viable basis to bring a criminal prosecution with respect to Goldman Sachs. As they exist at this time, implies that changes in law and evidence alike could have produced an indictment, which isn't so. New evidence, of course, could change the outcome. The DOJ's statement expressly contemplates as much. A smoking gun email from a whistleblower or a wiretap gone hot might have tipped the scales in favor of prosecution. A single admission can flip a whole case on a dime. But the law doesn't work that way. The Senate referred Goldman to the DOJ for criminal fraud, where the law is very, very old. And any new law passed to ensnare Goldman would have been ex post facto and constitutionally void on arrival. The statement should say, as it exists, to make it clear that Goldman could have been indicted based only on new evidence. But it doesn't say that. And the question is why? For three years, details about how the DOJ was handling cases of Wall Street crime have emerged from various sources 
and the policy of non-prosecution is now well known. But the statement exonerating Goldman Sachs has remained inscrutable. That changed earlier this year when the DOJ produced a one-page document that supplied the missing piece of the puzzle. As it turns out, the Department of Justice has ignored black letter law all along to carry out an agenda that was illegal from the start. In this light, as we shall see, the DOJ statement is flawless. Goldman Sachs exploded onto the public stage in April of 2010 when it got hammered by the Senate for molting clients out of billions in bad mortgage investments. Goldman designed the investments to fail and raked in billions when clients got wiped out. You think they know that you think something is a piece of crap when you sell it to them and then bet against it? You think they know that? Ten days before the hearing, the Securities and Exchange Commission had sued Goldman for securities fraud and the Senate, which was investigating the financial crisis, wanted answers. The Permanent Subcommittee on Investigations was working on a report that got into the causes of the 2008 meltdown, and toxic mortgage-backed securities like those sold by Goldman Sachs had been the dominant catalyst. The Senate report would run 640 pages and over 2,900 footnotes, and at fully 260 pages, 40% of the total, Goldman Sachs stole the show. Goldman's Hudson deal highlights the bank's two-step fraud for easy money. Step one was sniffing out loans likely to default and pooling them for sale under names like Hudson. This often cleared bad debts off Goldman's books. Step two was making huge bets that the loans would fail after investors bought them and keeping the bets hidden. To get clients to put their money into bad investments, Goldman invested $6 million of its own money in Hudson. Goldman then advertised its $6 million investment quite accurately in marketing materials. Goldman claimed it had an interest in Hudson's success, which again was technically accurate. Goldman hid just one little detail, that while it had $6 million riding on Hudson's success, it had secretly bet $2 billion that Hudson would fail. Goldman made money, in other words, by betting on horse races that it rigged. Goldman put $1 on its poisoned horse to win, 
and touted this bet so that clients would bet on Hudson themselves. Secretly, though, Goldman bet $330 that Hudson would die running down the stretch. Goldman made vast sums of money on its hidden death bets when investors got cleaned out. Goldman pocketed nearly $1.7 billion in gross revenues from Hudson One, all of which was at the expense of the Hudson investors. Not surprisingly, the SEC's case for securities fraud was a layup. That's a basic securities fraud claim. You sold me something that's AAA, but it wasn't. That's it. In front of the Senate, Lloyd Blankfein offered two legal defenses. While we strongly disagree with the SEC's complaint, I also recognize how such a complicated transaction may look to many people. To them, it is confirmation of how out of control they believe Wall Street has become, no matter how sophisticated the parties or what disclosures were made. We have to better Neither the sophisticated parties' defense nor the accurate disclosures' defense had any legal merit. Arguing that Goldman's disclosures were accurate failed on both the facts and the law. As a factual matter, it failed to duck the brunt of the fraud charge, which was concealment, not affirmative misrepresentation. As a legal matter, Blankfein's claim of accurate disclosures likewise misses the mark, since the SEC's case of fraud was grounded in concealment. Supreme Court authority has made it crystal clear that conduct itself can be deceptive without oral or written statements at all. Blankfein's other defense, that Goldman's investors were sophisticated parties who didn't rely on Goldman's misrepresentations, badly missed the mark as well. Regardless of the sophistication or knowledge of the customer, reliance is immaterial in an SEC case against a broker. In short, Goldman Sachs had no legal defense at all and quickly paid the largest fine ever levied by the SEC to make the case go away. By now, the Senate Judiciary Committee had gotten interested, not so much in Goldman Sachs or even Wall Street, but in the DOJ's failure to prosecute any major bank or executive. Senator Ted Kaufman elicited some highly revealing testimony from Lanny Brewer, the head of the DOJ's criminal division responsible for bringing prosecutions. Brewer claimed that his efforts to prosecute Wall Street were being thwarted by the high legal standards for proving fraud. The alleged hurdles he complained of, however, were exactly the same bogus legal defenses that Lloyd Blankfein had used. Just as Lloyd Blankfein had tried to scapegoat Goldman's victims as too sophisticated to have relied on the bank's lies, here was Brewer making exactly the same claim. Many times you have very sophisticated sophisticated parties on both sides of these very, very difficult and complicated transactions. The problem is that a victim's reliance is irrelevant in criminal fraud cases, just as it was in Goldman's securities fraud case. Whether or not a victim in fact relied upon a defendant's false representations is irrelevant in criminal fraud cases. Brewer revealed that the DOJ had been using another page out of Goldman's playbook when it came to disclosures. According to Brewer, the DOJ hadn't even considered cases like Hudson, where deceptive concealment was the issue. Like Blankfein, Brewer's litmus test was whether a disclosure was accurate. Every one of the people we have prosecuted made false statements. Brewer's false legal standard enabled him to ignore cases of fraudulent concealment, precisely the same error made by Lloyd Blankfein. The question is how and why America's number one criminal fraud suspect and number two law enforcer were committing exactly the same fundamental legal errors just weeks apart from each other. The first clue about Brewer's copycat legal errors came in May of 2012 when Forbes ran an article about his law firm. Covington & Burling, the same white-collar defense firm that Attorney General Eric Holder had come from, represents all of the two big to fail banks, starting with Goldman Sachs. The question raised by Forbes is Wall Street too big for jail, got a lot louder when the DOJ exonerated Goldman in August of 2012. Four months after that, when the DOJ refused to indict any UBS executives, despite the bank's admission to criminal rate rigging, it was no longer a question. Yeah, I mean, that's a factor. And let that, I'm not talking about just this case, um, but in others that we have resolved, the impact on the stability of the financial markets around the world is something that we take into consideration. We, talk, we reach out to experts 
outside of the Justice Department to talk about what are the consequences of uh, actions that we might take, what would be the impact of those um, actions if we wanted to make a particular prosecutive decision or determination with regard to a particular institution. So that factors into the kinds of um, decisions that, that we make. At this point, as questions swirled around how exactly the DOJ's refusal to prosecute certain banks squared with the rule of law, the nerviest reporter in America showed up in Lanny Brewer's office looking for answers. When The Untouchables aired in January of 2013, it blew away everything the media had ever done on the DOJ's refusal to prosecute Wall Street by answering the most fundamental question of all, which no one else had even asked. Did the department undertake a purposeful, concerted, timely investigation of higher level Wall Street executives? It took Martin Smith just two questions to prove, through Lanny Brewer's mouth, that the DOJ had never lifted a finger to even investigate, much less prosecute, Wall Street crime. We spoke to a couple of sources from within the criminal division, and they reported that when it came to Wall Street, there were no investigations going on, there were no subpoenas, no document reviews, no wiretaps. Well, I don't know who you spoke with, because we have looked hard at the very types of matters that you're talking about. These sources said that at the weekly indictment approval meetings, that there was no case ever mentioned that was even close to indicting Wall Street for financial crimes. Well, Martin, if you look at what we in the U.S. attorney community did, I think you have to take a step back. The DOJ's failure to investigate, though shocking, is just one of countless examples of its all-out campaign to serve global banks at the expense of all else, including the law that it's required to enforce. Martin Smith also captured, but didn't air, Brewer's many attempts throughout the interview to blame his failure to prosecute on the alleged difficulty of proving criminal fraud. A look at the case law, however, reveals that Brewer was simply lying, and he didn't lie about just one element of criminal fraud, he lied about three. First, Brewer claimed that unless someone makes a false statement, there's no fraud. That's simply false. No statements are required at all where deceptive concealment is at issue, like Goldman's Hudson deal. The case law is unambiguous. Fraud can be affected not only by deceitful statements, but also by statements of half-truths or concealment of material facts. Brewer was again parroting Goldman CEO Lloyd Blankfein on this point. Second, Brewer claimed that the DOJ has to prove that you intended to commit a crime in fraud cases. This, too, blatantly misstates the legal standard. Under Brewer's false intend to commit a crime standard, no one would ever be convicted of fraud. The actual black letter test for fraudulent intent is whether the accused acted in a way reasonably calculated to deceive. Third, Brewer claimed that fraud requires proof that the other side of the transaction relied on what you were saying. Once again, Brewer trotted out Lloyd Blankfein's sophisticated counterparty's defense. But Brewer was lying about the law here, too. This particular lie, though, revealed Brewer's willingness to invent a fake legal requirement out of thin air. It was so aggressively false that a federal judge called out Lanny Brewer in the New York Review of Books in a 4,000-word essay on the DOJ's failure to prosecute global banks, Judge Jed Rakoff from the Southern District of New York blasted Brewer. Brewer's reliance requirement, Judge Rakoff wrote, totally misstates the law. In actuality, in a criminal fraud case, the government is never required to prove, ever, that one party to a transaction relied on the word of another, because that would give a crooked seller a license to lie whenever he was dealing with a sophisticated buyer. Having shown that the DOJ never prosecuted Wall Street crime because it never investigated, the Untouchables next turned to the reason why. It was never the law. Had the global banks really committed no crimes, Lanny Brewer wouldn't have lied about it at every turn. The real impediment to prosecutions was something else. Brewer himself had actually explained what it was in a prior speech about the DOJ's refusal to prosecute the worst white-collar crimes. While the speech had been about corporations generally, Martin Smith very deftly got Brewer to admit that he really meant big banks. You gave a speech before the New York Bar Association. 
And in that speech, you made a reference to losing sleep at night, worrying about what a lawsuit might um, result in uh, at a large financial right. institution. Brewer had delivered the speech to a bar association dominated by white-collar defense lawyers four months before The Untouchables aired. In it, he provided a roadmap for how to make economic rather than legal arguments that would shield criminal clients from prosecution. We are frequently on the receiving end of presentations from defense counsel, CEOs, and economists who argue that the collateral consequences of an indictment would be devastating, just devastating for their client. In my conference room over these past years, I've heard sober predictions that a company or a bank might fail if we indict, that innocent employees could lose their jobs, that entire industries could be affected, and that even global markets will feel the effects. Sometimes, but let me stress not always, these pre presentations are compelling. Brewer's speech revealed that he had lied to the Senate, falsely testifying that his failure to prosecute was due to the legal difficulty of proving fraud. In fact, Brewer now admitted, it was economic arguments about collateral consequences that had all along compelled him not to prosecute. Former Senator Ted Kaufman was not amused. That was very disturbing to me, very disturbing. That was never raised at any time during any of our discussions. While Kaufman was rightly disturbed by Brewer's false concealment of his real reasons for not prosecuting, he seemed to miss the most chilling aspect of Brewer's speech. The collateral consequences presentations in Brewer's conference room really aren't arguments at all. They're threats, since the banks are forecasting how severely they themselves will respond to any checks on their criminality. Curiously, it was Kaufman himself who confirmed that this is exactly how Wall Street responded to his own investigation. Lots of people on Wall Street said, what are you doing? You're trying to destroy the banks. There's no crime up here. We didn't commit any crimes. There's no reason to come up here and, and start talking about crimes. Plus, we're very, very fragile. And, you know, something could happen if, in fact, you start talking about crime, which was just totally, completely ridiculous. Taken together, Kaufman's recollection in Brewer's speech exposed the DOJ's collateral consequences doctrine as a Trojan horse built by Wall Street. While styled as a guideline to assist in responsible law enforcement, collateral consequences is in fact a device for threatening Main Street as a means for avoiding indictment. It's no more than a veneer of legalese to cloak the displacement of American law by the will of global banks, which freely issue threats to immunize their crimes that Kaufman ridiculed the consequences that compelled Brewer not to prosecute only goes to the credibility of the threats and highlights the fact that those threats were made and understood. One must ask, then, why Brewer turned his conference room into a launch pad for those threats and how it jibed with his sworn duty to defend the targets of those threats against all enemies. It is here that the line between criminal and cop gets eradicated completely. And in deciding how you're going to pursue an institution, you have to at least evaluate whether or not innocent people might lose jobs or there might be some sort of a collateral event. It's simply impossible to tell whether Brewer had received a threat or was issuing one on behalf of UBS. On Frontline, however, Brewer changed his story about who was issuing opinions on collateral consequences. Magically, the global banks simply vanished. Is that really the job of a prosecutor to worry uh, about anything other than simply pursuing justice? Well, I think I am pursuing justice, and I think the, the entire responsibility of the department is to pursue justice. But in any given case, I think I and prosecutors around the country being responsible should speak to regulators, should speak to experts. Because if I bring a case against Institution A, and as a result of bringing that case, there's some huge economic effect. If it creates a ripple effect so that suddenly counterparties and other financial institutions or other companies that had nothing to do with this are affected badly, it's a factor we need to know and understand. Brewer's discomfort with his own speech was so extreme that he invented regulators out of thin air to divert attention away from the Wall Street advocates who'd actually compelled him not to prosecute. Either way, 
Brewer had told another bald-faced lie. Either he lied to the New York City Bar Association by saying it was Wall Street advocates and their opinions that had compelled him not to prosecute, or he'd lied to the public on TV by shifting that responsibility to regulators. Brewer announced his resignation from the DOJ the day after The Untouchables aired. He went back to Covington and Burling, where a $4 million a year paycheck was waiting for him. After national outrage over The Untouchables forced Lanny Brewer to step down, Congress began investigating the source of the DOJ's collateral consequences opinions. Though the investigation was largely done for show, simply going through the motions was more than enough to reveal that Brewer's regulators were a total fabrication. A real investigation would have looked much different. A carefully crafted subpoena, for instance, would have produced the sources of the DOJ's collateral consequences opinions more or less immediately. But a real investigation would have exposed Congress's biggest donors as criminal institutions that threatened Main Street to elevate themselves above the law. So Congress pretended not to know about Brewer's speech and sought the identities of the fictitious regulators in his made-for-TV story. The outcome was predictable. Not a single document, nor any regulator's name, nor the first shred of any evidence at all ever turned up. Brewer had simply made up the fake regulators, just like he'd made up fake legal requirements for proving fraud. In reality, Lanny Brewer didn't prosecute because he put the desires of his firm's criminal banking clients before the laws he swore to uphold, and he lied as much as necessary to hide this fact. The fly in Brewer's ointment was his New York City bar speech, flatly admitting that global banks routinely compelled him not to prosecute. Not surprisingly then, the DOJ lied about Lanny Brewer's speech too, falsely denying each and every one of its many incriminating elements. Before the untouchables, the DOJ had admitted it was frequently on the receiving end of collateral consequences presentations from banks, which had compelled it not to prosecute. After this revelation blew up in the DOJ's face on the untouchables, however, the DOJ lied and said it was unaware of its meetings with the banks. What's so astonishing about the DOJ's lie about its history of bank meetings is that it's almost a carbon copy of the very speech that it's so desperate to run away from. History wasn't the only thing the DOJ changed with its about face, however. It also swapped witnesses for the congressional hearing one week later. Before the DOJ falsely denied Brewer's speech, the House had designated James Cole to testify. Cole was the Deputy Attorney General under Eric Holder. But as soon as the DOJ denied its frequent meetings with the banks, it replaced Cole with a lower-ranking Mithili Rahman, an underling of Lanny Brewer's. Rahman was a 17-year DOJ veteran and assistant head of the criminal division. She'd worked closely with Brewer on cases like Medicare fraud. It was her job to explain the DOJ's collateral consequences doctrine and to identify the regulators who'd provided opinions. Rahman was unable to testify for more than a half dozen paragraphs before she started lying. That testimony is false. The 2008 U.S. Attorney's Manual contains a number of factors that prosecutors can consider when deciding whether to indict a corporation. Contrary to Rahman's testimony, prosecutors are only permitted, never required, to consider collateral consequences. In other words, collateral consequences is merely an optional consideration, not mandatory as Rahman falsely testified. The manual reserves mandatory language only for the most critical duties of a prosecutor, like punishing crime. A prosecutor's duty to enforce the law requires the investigation and prosecution of criminal wrongdoing. But Rahman lied about this, too. Congress didn't find it the least bit strange that tending to the health of criminal banks is mandatory for prosecutors, while indicting criminals is optional. 
This speaks as much to the corruption of Congress as it does to the outrageousness of DOJ lies, concealing its takeover by global banks. As for the names of the fake regulators, Rahman tried to use unidentified ongoing investigations to falsely imply that the regulators are real, but that their names are some big secret. Only a follow-up question forced her to admit that in all prior investigations spanning four years, there's not a shred of evidence that any regulators actually exist. Rahman's nervousness during this exchange is as telling as the body language of the man over her right shoulder. Rahman's failure to name a single regulator, or find even one email or calendar entry, arises from the fact that the DOJ flat-out lied about consulting with regulators. It never happened. But Rahman did succeed in concealing the truth, which is that all of the DOJ's collateral consequences opinions came from the banks, just as her boss Lanny Brewer had admitted. Brewer, of course, had returned to private practice at Covington and Burling, and less than a year after she testified, Mithali Rahman ended her 18-year DOJ career to join him. They were later joined by Eric Holder when he stepped down as Attorney General. The trio's failures at the DOJ tell us much, but not everything. Rahman couldn't identify any collateral consequences regulators because there never were any. Brewer couldn't point to any Wall Street investigations because there weren't any of those either. And thus Holder can't point to any prosecution of global banks despite their astonishing litany of admitted crimes. And yet all three insisted that the DOJ looked hard at cases of criminal fraud. One must wonder what they had in mind. This brings us to their partner, Daniel Suleiman, and back to Goldman Sachs. In May of 2013, Suleiman was returning to Covington from the Department of Justice. I was lucky enough to convince Dan over two and a half years ago to join me at the Department of Justice, Brewer said. Now that I'm back at Covington and Burling, I was doubly thrilled to convince Dan to yet again join me. Despite the fact that Suleiman had never prosecuted so much as a parking ticket, Brewer installed him as the co-leader of the phony investigation of Goldman Sachs. Suleiman claimed, after an entire year spent looking at his law firm's own client, that there wasn't enough evidence to prosecute. This, of course, begs the question of what efforts, if any, Suleiman undertook to obtain evidence in the first place, because the superiors make it clear that there were none. Rahman's admission that the DOJ looked at collateral consequences to decide whether to investigate buttresses Martin Smith's most incriminating disclosure that the DOJ failed to investigate at all. We spoke to a couple of sources from within the criminal division, and they reported that when it came to Wall Street, there were no investigations going on, there were no subpoenas, no document reviews, no wiretaps. What's more, when Rahman testified in May of 2013, the Senate's comprehensive investigation of Wall Street had been complete for over two years, and yet there'd been no collateral consequences to speak of. This exposes the DOJ's pretense that investigations would destabilize the financial system as nonsense. The DOJ's stability excuse is so patently absurd, in fact, that not even a former senator could refrain from openly mocking it on national television. Lots of people on Wall Street said, what are you doing? You're trying to destroy the banks. There's no crime up here. We didn't commit any crimes. There's no reason to come up here and, and start talking about crimes. Plus, we're very, very fragile. And, you know, something could happen if, in fact, you start talking about crime, which was just totally, completely ridiculous. 
This brings us back to the question that Congress and the full spectrum of media outlets manage never to ask. So which banks were in Brewer's conference room? It's far from an idle question. These banks asserted and were granted criminal immunity, which is the legal privilege of kings. In the U.S., as we know from Watergate, no one with the possible exception of the sitting president is immune from criminal prosecution. In 1973, the Justice Department researched the legal issue, which was headed for the Supreme Court before being mooted by Nixon's resignation. The heft of scholarly opinion is that sovereign immunity has no place in American law. The Federalist Papers, however, repeatedly note that criminal proceedings can go forward after the president has left office, never addressing the case of a sitting president. On this basis, Nixon's DOJ concluded that the sitting president and no one else, not even the vice president, is immune from criminal prosecution. Either way, the DOJ has proved beyond all doubt, through its own words and backed up with an unbroken record of failure, the global banks are immune from prosecution. They obtained that immunity simply by decreeing it to Lanny Brewer, who by his own admission acquiesced in a DOJ conference room. In so doing, Brewer acted on behalf of the very foreign and domestic enemies that he swore to defend the country against. So who are America's real sovereigns, her criminal kings? An unremitting campaign of lies and deception by the Justice Department kept us a secret for too many years, but no more. Last year, DOJ personnel let the cat out of the bag, responding to a Freedom of Information Act request that sought documentation of the banks on Brewer's calendar. Just one document turned up, a meeting notice that went out from Brewer to Goldman Sachs and Brewer's team at the DOJ. The meeting took place after Goldman learned that the SEC was preparing a case for securities fraud. While the names of Goldman's people are redacted, the names of the DOJ lawyers are not. Brewer's choice of attendees is revealing. Brewer and Rahman, of course, are partners at Covington & Burling, Goldman's law firm. Steve Fagel and Greg Andres also have private professional connections to Goldman Sachs. Fagel, like Rahman and Brewer, is at Covington as well. Greg Andres, while not at Covington, represents Goldman Sachs in his own right. His name surfaced in a story about his wife, the judge in a wrongful termination case involving Goldman Sachs. The judge ruled in Goldman's favor after revealing that Andres, her husband, was actively counseling Goldman as its lawyer. When the plaintiff asked for more information about the nature of Andre's affiliation with Goldman, the judge dismissed the case. The timing of the DOJ's meeting with Goldman reveals as much as the rosters of Goldman-affiliated lawyers on both sides of the table. The meeting took place just weeks before Lloyd Blankfein presented two bogus legal defenses to the Senate. It's therefore distinctly possible that Blankfein was parroting Brewer, and not the other way around. When Brewer trotted out Blankfein's legal defenses in the Senate, in other words, falsely claiming they were the law, he wasn't parroting Blankfein at all. He was quoting himself. It's next to impossible that the topic of collateral consequences didn't come up at the meeting. For one thing, Brewer told the New York City Bar Association that global banks frequently brought the topic up in his conference room, and this email is the only document evidencing that admission. For another, Blankfein resorted to sham legal defenses because Goldman didn't have any real ones, and yet the DOJ didn't prosecute or even investigate Goldman Sachs for criminal fraud. The lack of any investigation, according to Rahman's testimony, is exactly what can happen when collateral consequences gets into the equation. Notably, six months after Goldman met with the DOJ to discuss the anti-fraud task force, Daniel Suleiman joined the DOJ not only as co-leader of the sham Goldman investigation, but as a leader of the very same task force discussed at the meeting. There's one last thing, too. Collateral consequences, unlike some other meeting topic, explains the DOJ's implication that the law could change so as to indict Goldman Sachs. That outcome runs roughshod over the constitutional prohibition of ex post facto laws and is a fair indication that it wasn't in force. There are two ways that could have been the case. One way would have been to amend the Constitution, by convention or vote, to allow ex post facto laws. But there was no amendment, which leaves the second way, and that would have been an overthrow of the Constitution by coup d'etat.
in a coup d'etat, a person or group intent on seizing power commits criminal acts to overthrow the legitimate sovereign, while many overthrows take place out in the open, and there's no doubt in anyone's mind about what's happened. A coup is much easier to pull off behind closed doors. The mark of a coup isn't the openness of defiance. That actually has nothing to do with it. The sign of a coup is the illegality of acts by those in close proximity to sovereign power and their false claims about sovereign authority. The supremacy of law over human authority is what drove the Declaration of Independence, giving rise to the entire American legal system. A coup in the U.S. would thus find America subverted at her very roots, with the equivalent of a king replacing law as the supreme power. This inverted power structure rears its head in the DOJ's exoneration, which speaks of the law like it's a nose of wax. The tell is the phrase, the law at this time. It reflects the British legal truism that colonists found revolting, namely, that the king can do no wrong. Among other things, it means the king is immune from the rules that bind everyone else. A king, though, unlike a constitution, is mortal, and the scope of the law under a king changes, by definition, the minute his reign comes to its inevitable end. The DOJ statement, that the law at this time doesn't support Goldman's indictment, reflects the so-called law under mortal human power. American constitutional law, by contrast, doesn't hinge on a heartbeat, and the qualifier is totally out of place. The DOJ's exoneration is far from the only tell that in America, the rule of law is dead. The DOJ's countless admissions that collateral consequences immunizes global banks, but no one else, puts the matter beyond dispute. Mithili Rahman all but bragged that collateral consequences is never extended to individuals facing prosecution. For criminal global banks like Goldman Sachs, not only do collateral consequences get into the equation, they get into DOJ conference rooms, filled with the bank's lawyers working temp assignments at the DOJ. The red carpet assembly then overthrows the legal system in a one-hour ceremony, in which DOJ officials deem criminal threats from their private practice clients superior to their country's laws. The New York Times was unable to spin Brewer's email and was forced to ignore what it actually says instead. The expressly stated meeting topic was the president's new anti-fraud task force, but the Times reported, based on an anonymous source, that the meeting was about terrorism. As it happens, that's accurate. The Times just left out the terrorist's name. Allow us.